We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, thank everybody for coming tonight. Uh, I'm Lisa Ackerman, Interim CEO of World Monuments Fund. Many people in the room know me. I've been here for about 11 years um, and I uh, was very happy to be Executive Vice President in charge of our field programs for um, all of that time and um, even happier now to um, continue in the role of World Monuments Fund. But the greatest joy is always um, our work in the field and forging relationships with colleagues and, um, and the reports from the field program that you're with us tonight for is just a little glimpse into that world of our field work and we hope um, everybody enjoys hearing about the projects. And um, you know, I, everybody has said to me in the last uh, 24 hours obviously how devastating the fire at Notre Dame in Paris is and we've been in touch with our colleagues there an extraordinary amount of financial support has come through in 24 hours. I don't think anybody doubted that Notre Dame would be rebuilt, but I don't think anybody could have predicted that in 24 hours more than 700 million euros would be raised wow. towards the effort. Um, so, um, you know, we are extremely glad to know that this kind of support has come forward from French citizens and French corporations. And um, surely this won't be the last we hear of such devastating acts. And the only thing we can hope is that we continue to learn better and better protocols um, about how to protect buildings and also um, how to give um, many historic sites support before disasters happen, which in many ways is the story of the project in Mandalay. So I'm going to turn it over to Francois Tenturier in a few moments. But just to say that all of these projects um, bring together a network of people. And often when you work with WMF once, um, that doesn't mean we let go of you. So Francois is such a case. Um, he worked with us when we set up the Center for Khmer Studies in Siem Reap. Many people know we've had a long-term, nearly 30-year relationship in Cambodia. And while that started out as a conservation program with an emphasis on training, it became clear very early on in our work in Cambodia that there also needed to be a rebuilding of the intellectual uh, opportunities in Cambodia and creating the Center for Khmer Studies, which is one of the American overseas research centers, um, was such an opportunity. And having a talented emerging scholar such as Francois work with us in those early years was critical. And so when we had an opportunity to think about working in Myanmar, and we knew that Francois had set up an organization called the Yinya Institute. He was a natural partner for us to reach out to. And I'm going to leave um, the rest of the story to him to say, um, but only to add in my comments that many times people ask us how do we pick projects. And it's not always easy to articulate that vision. But when we had the opportunity to begin working in Myanmar, we wanted something that was really emblematic of Burmese culture and something that really could be identified as a special opportunity, not just to restore a building, but to really understand the artistic traditions of a culture, as well as contribute to building capacity in the country today. So as we looked around um, and rejected many things that were suggested, uh, Shui Dong Monastery in uh, Mandalay became our focus because indeed the teak wood carving traditions uh, in Myanmar are very reflected in this building. And there's also two universities in Mandalay that teach uh, architecture. And we thought there would be great opportunities to work with young students and with faculty at the university. And then um, I can't deny that one of the other great assets has turned out to be the US government. There is a site um, in Mandalay known as the Jefferson Center. And we've had an extraordinary opportunity to have more than a dozen lectures there during the course of this project. And the lectures have been on everything from the history of monasticism in Mandalay to wood carving traditions, to our conservation projects, to the idea of documentation. We actually ran a workshop on laser scanning for the students from Mandalay Technological University. We brought um, some of our friends and colleagues from the University of Florida uh, to run that training session. And so this project has been enormously collaborative. And we've had probably people from more than 10 countries come and provide workshops and expertise and training. And so it's really been one of these great joys to learn about Burmese culture, to learn about Myanmar today, 
and to forge the kinds of relationships that I know Francois will tell us a bit about tonight. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to him. Uh, thank you, Lisa. Thank you, uh, everyone, for coming to tonight for this uh, talk. It, it's, a, it's a great pleasure to be here in New York, um, and it's uh, great to uh, be with you tonight. Uh, so I'll be, yeah, as Lisa was mentioning, I'll be talking about uh, this project that, uh, that, that was started in 2013 um, with some uh, State Department funding, uh, and it's been directed by Jeff Allen, and I'll also take occasion of this talk to thank him, because it's been uh, a great pleasure to work uh, with him all these years, and uh, it's like six years, and I think it's, uh, I mean, we can expect uh, more years uh, of collaborative work. And um, so uh, today it's a report from the field, and I'll be specifically talking about the carving traditions in, in, uh, in Mandalay, in Myanmar, uh, that uh, are, I mean, it's actually one aspect that we are actually focusing, focusing on uh, uh, for that project. And it's, it's a distinctive feature, as you will see, from, uh, uh, from Upper Myanmar, from uh, uh, Myanmar history. Uh, so uh, the, the talk is about Burmese woodcraft and their revival in the 21st century. My talk will be uh, in four parts. I'll be uh, giving you a very brief uh, historical background of Mandalay. Um, I'll be talking uh, in general terms about the, uh, the, the conservation project. I'll be uh, talking about the tradition of woodcrafts in Mandalay. And um, finally, I'll be talking about the replacement carving campaign at the Shwenando Monastery. So one thing that um, maybe some of you might not be aware of is that Mandalay was actually uh, founded in a very recent time, in, in uh, the mid-19th century, 1857 uh, precisely. And it was annexed by the British in uh, 1885. And uh, Mandalay is actually the, the last uh, royal city of a succession of royal cities that had been built by royalty over, pre over the previous centuries. And uh, the process of relocation was uh, made possible by the use of wood, uh, that, I mean, uh, with, wood, with a construction of wooden structure that could be dis disassembled very easily from one side to the next. What you have here on the left is, um, is one fold of a, a manuscript uh, from the mid-19th century, and it's, it depicts uh, a, prelimin, a, a walking drawing of, of the city of Mandalay when it was founded, like few, uh, one or two years before the actual uh, establishment. So, of course, um, uh, building a city entailed uh, the construction of a royal palace, and uh, we have here uh, pictures uh, from uh, the 1920s, um, taken of uh, the, at that time the still standing royal palace before it was burned down in World War II, during World War II. And uh, you have pictures of the different royal thrones. Uh, if you see here below, uh, you have an elevation of the royal palace in Mandalay, and it's, 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 it was a, an expansive cluster of uh, royal pavilions, and uh, all of them made of wood made of teak wood and uh, so and in some in, in some of the most prominent uh, wooden halls uh, the royalty had uh, various thrones uh, placed and with, I mean, with various symbolism and um, and here on in the center of the uh, of the slide you have the actually the main facade of the of the palace the eastern facade of the palace with, uh, that was most commonly uh, known by uh, visitors because um, the western uh, part was actually off limit to anyone else. So besides the royal city itself, besides the royal palace itself, uh, one, one major aspect of, of Mandalay was construction of Buddhist monasteries. And um, so the relocation of royal cities entailed a royal patronage of Buddhist uh, monastic structure and, and uh, at which uh, different uh, monks were, were residing. And because tr teak trade was a royal monopoly, it was very easy for royalty to actually build uh, teak wood monasteries. And you see examples of some of them, oh, sorry, uh, here, the Salin Monastery, the Qu Queen Supalayat Monastery, King Thibault. So uh, just to uh, be pre more precise, all these monasteries were actually built in the later part of, um, I mean, um, after Mandalay was established. So it's like in the latest years of, of Mandalay 
um, as, a, as a royal capital of, Man, uh, of Myanmar. So when, when the British annex the country in, in 1885 um, and caused the collapse of the royal monarchy, um, it, was, it was, of course, no longer any uh, royalty, any royal uh, um, person to actually patronize uh, 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 the monastic order. So it was uh, upon the respons uh, responsibility of uh, which merchant to, to, to take over. So one important aspect to remember is that uh, in the, the short history of Mandela is that um, the, the royal complex was badly damaged during World War II. Uh, the, um, many of the wooden structures that were uh, part of, the, of this royal complex were actually occupied by uh, Japanese soldiers. Uh, we know that the Shwenando, um, which had been relocated to a different uh, place uh, at, at the death of the pen penultimate king, uh, King Mindong, uh, uh, had been occupied by Japanese soldiers, and w uh, these soldiers were actually using uh, some wooden panels as a firewood. So you can easily imagine uh, how bad uh, in, in, in the state of disrepair uh, that uh, the monastery uh, had uh, experienced. As you see from, from the picture, the, it's here where we ha you have the royal city with a large moat, and then different monasteries at the, at the foot of Mandalay Hill. Uh, and then a row of rest houses that, um, I mean, um, pilgrims to Mandalay could, uh, um, um, uh, could stay at uh, in order to, uh, to uh, do their pilgrimage. So now I will turn um, more specifically to the conservation project. One important aspect of the conservation project and for which we are very fortunate is to have, um, uh, I mean, photographic records taken by the Archaeological Survey of India in 1904-1905. We don't have any, uh, we don't have many pictures, but at least the resolution there, the, uh, the details they provide uh, are quite uh, significant. And uh, I will come back later to these uh, pictures uh, and show how they've, they've been helping us uh, develop our methodology for the missing uh, woodwork. So here I'm showing um, pictures of uh, post-World War, I mean, of the condition of the Shwenandu at different times, in, uh, mostly post-World War II, of course. Uh, so, uh, as you see, in, 19, uh, in 1955, um, after the Japanese soldiers had occupied the, the building, most of the um, decorative elements had gone. Uh, it, it was really, uh, in 1975, we are fortunate for uh, a German um, professor, uh, lang language professor, to have documented uh, quite thoroughly uh, the, um, the different sides and different facades of the of the uh, of the building. And here, in 2015, uh, when we started the project, I mean, actually two years before, but we did uh, photo do photo documentation uh, in in 2015. Um, we have, uh, you, can, you can see that, that some of the wooden elements have been uh, restored, and this is the, the result of a 1995 restoration campaign that had been done, that had been conducted by the Department of uh, Archaeology and National Museum uh, 10 years before. I mean, the project is basically uh, is based on, on five aspects that I'm showing you. Um, so um, we spend a lot of time surveying and assessing as a condition of, of the structure. Um, in the meantime, we, have, uh, we, have, we are uh, obviously working with local, um, uh, I mean, like local Myanmar architects, uh, conservators, and, uh, and uh, university, university faculty. And it's part of our capacity building and training uh, aspect uh, project of, of, the, of, the pro of the project. We are, we've been uh, documenting the, uh, the the, the structure uh, for uh, since the beginning, and we are uh, also engaged in public out outreach, uh, li like Lisa was mentioning, uh, through a different through a series of lectures being given at the Jefferson Center in Mandalay, um, and, uh, well, and of course the most important aspect of the project, of course, is the physical intervention and conservation of the actual structure. So I'm going to go briefly through. Uh, this different aspect. So as you can imagine, for, for, for those of you who have been to Southeast Asia and South Asia, 
uh, the monsoon in Mandalay is very uh, uh, strong, is very fierce, and uh, it's very often the case that uh, the surrounding of, um, of the building are completely flooded, as you see on the left picture. Uh, and the, I mean, the two pictures here are shown, uh, I mean, show the, the veranda. And I mean, there, there are gutter problems. It's, it's really, and this is, a, I mean, this, all these pictures were taken in 2015, uh, taken by Jeff. Uh, um, and it, it, it follows uh, the restoration uh, campaign made by uh, the Department of Archaeology in 1995. So you can see within just 20 years how, uh, how fast the, the, the condition uh, of the structure has deteriorated. So one, one of the main also aspects uh, 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 of the survey was to emphasize uh, the damage caused by, uh, by rain and flood waters. So we don't, we, of course we have rain water, but uh, we have also uh, f I mean, uh, flood water which come from a canal nearby. And when these, when these two waters come together, I mean like the meat under the, under the, stru the structure, uh, I mean, they cause crack and, and, and the water stagnate because, I mean, there's, there's, no, po uh, poor, uh, there's no drainage. And uh, so you can see here, um, uh, you can see here many cracks that have happened um, again uh, within the 20 years that uh, uh, the building had been restored in 1985. And uh, so, uh, I mean, around the, uh, around the base of the columns and in many parts of um, uh, the, uh, underneath the structure. When uh, one also one aspect which is really important to consider is that when uh, the teak has been uh, exposed to water, um, uh, we, we, we have fungus growth happening. And so you see here uh, different types of fungus uh, in different locations. So this on the left side is uh, uh, that, that, I mean, fungus growth that has happened on, on the base of the columns. Uh, here, uh, it's on the tip of the columns, on, on around uh, the veranda, uh, I mean, on the top of the veranda post, and here uh, at the level of the joist, um, in, I mean, under, under the building. And of course, with uh, fungal growth developing and with uh, the teak natural protection being undermined, we have uh, termite, uh, which attack the wood, uh, the teak, and uh, we uh, and then the, I mean it's, it's so one one of the main one of the main aspects of the project has been to have um, I mean a strategy to uh, make sure that the, all the termites are uh, kept away as, as as far away as possible from the structure to make sure that uh, I mean none of this uh, none of the new wood we are actually uh, putting. Um, around the veranda would be attacked uh, by, by the termite. Here I'm showing some of the um, assessments that were uh, that was done by Brian Rideout, a termite uh, specialist, uh, who, um, who went uh, in, who came to uh, Mandalay in 2014. So I mean we had I mean each of the posts were, uh, was individu individually assessed, um, and we uh, we extended. Uh, we assessed the, the extent of the damage and, uh, and for, each, for each column, we assessed how big, large, and uh, how fun and where uh, the termites uh, had, had damaged the, I mean, the columns, the tea columns. We also, uh, I mean, with uh, the assistance of Stephen Kelly, we also had an assessment of the soundness of the timber structure. And uh, we had, um, I mean, the collaboration from our local colleagues um, in, in uh, assessing how, um, I mean, whether the, the columns lean, how so sound they are. And uh, we had, uh, Stephen came up with these types of calculation uh, and the mapping of, of how uh, bad the leaning was for so some, some, some of the columns. Another aspect of the project is uh, the second accept, uh, aspect of the project is the capacity building and training. And on the left side, you have uh, the, the, the 3D scanning training that was offered by the University of Florida. Um, and, and then on the, on the right side, 
um, the, the internship program on conservation techniques uh, that has been offered to uh, students uh, from two universities in Mandalay, uh, University uh, Technolo Technological University of Mandalay and Mandalay Technological University, TUM and MTU. <laughs> And of course, one of the major aspects is the documentation process. And this has been really thoroughly uh, done. And uh, so based on the 3D scanning that uh, the uh, University of Florida had, uh, had done. And then we had our local um, uh, architects and engineers develop uh, details of, of this documentation, as you can see here. So this shows the veranda. Um, and uh, so here is a, uh, um, it shows a southern veranda, uh, actually no, it's a northern, uh, northern veranda uh, before intervention. And here uh, um, is a proposed intervention and uh, here is a type of uh, repair uh, done for the columns and for, um, I mean for the flooring of the veranda. Uh, here are, are two, uh, two picture, uh, one picture of the uh, eastern uh, facade of, of the Schwenando, uh, a 3D scan. And here is a higher view of uh, the, the building. Uh, again, it's a 3D scan, uh, which, I mean, gives us, which offers us a, a very level, of a very high level of details. And, and um, I mean, it might not look like uh, uh, looking at this picture, but it's actually a very good uh, base uh, I mean, a very good, uh, excellent reference for, uh, for future intervention. Here we have um, is, a, is a picture uh, of, of one of our public presentation made at the Jefferson Center. Uh, the Jefferson Center being, uh, as Lisa was mentioning, uh, the media and training center, um, I mean, operated by the U.S. Embassy in Yangon. And you can see here three monks um, we are uh, sitting uh, on, the, on the first row. I mean, it's, it's really interesting to have uh, the monastic community is very involved because you, you actually have Sri Nando being part of a, a larger cluster of monasteries and uh, the, the most prominent being the Atumashi. But uh, all, all around the Atumashi, you have seven other monasteries and with each of them, you have a large com uh, monastic I mean, uh, uh, community and they are very concerned about what an international project uh, can, can do. And, and they, uh, we are very much also uh, uh, happy to listen to, uh, to, uh, to their concerns. And, and so it's been a very good collaboration uh, over, the, over all these years. And um, it's, uh, so we are, I mean, any, any, for any of the lecture we do, uh, we always have like a representative of the monastic community and it's, it's, uh, we find it, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's very good. So in terms of physical, imp uh, so all these three, four um, aspects, uh, like survey assessment, capacity building and training, uh, documentation, and of course, public outreach has been uh, going all along these years. But the, the first three uh, aspects of the project w uh, have been done over the past five years and uh, four years, and physical intervention really started in uh, 2015, 2016. And uh, the, I mean, the focus was made uh, on, on the veranda, on the restoration and reconstruction of the veranda. And one of the main aspects was to revert uh, the flooring uh, to its previous, to its original condition because the 1995 restoration made by the Department of Ecology had actually uh, used a different type of, uh, of timber, uh, uh, when, when the original wood was teak, and also the flooring system had, be ch uh, had been changed. So one of the main, um, I mean, one of the main priority was really to uh, revert to this um, flooring, original flooring pattern yeah, that you can see here and uh, so make sure that the, I mean, the T column uh, were, uh, would be replaced when, when needed. Because many of the, uh, as, you can, as you may remember from, from the previous picture, uh, a lot of the fungus and, and termite attack 
act actually had actually undermined the condition of many of these uh, T columns. And uh, so it was decided after a thorough assessment to um, see, identify which columns would have to be completely replaced. So we, I mean, the strategy has been to, um, I mean, uh, to, to have three types of replacement, I mean, at least three types of categories, a total replacement, a partial replacement, when uh, parts of the columns could actually be replaced, and, and, uh, and keep uh, the other part as the original. And then the third category uh, was about uh, keeping uh, the, I mean, the original uh, column as, as it is. I would, say, I would have to mention also that we've had a, a great team of uh, people. Uh, so Luca, Luca Steidel, uh, who is a German carpenter, has been working with our team, uh, Cotet and Wang Win. And uh, so and it's, it's been great to have uh, this team uh, work together, even though language bar barrier can be sometimes uh, be a bit challenging. Um, for uh, another aspect of the physical intervention has been to um, uh, clean up uh, and, and restore as, as, as much as possible the decorative element uh, which adorn the, the, the veranda. So you, hear, you see here uh, on the central picture uh, the work uh, done by a wood conservator, Ursula Strugula, um, who has been involved uh, for the past years uh, with the project. So one on the left side, you have uh, a dragon-like called Naya in, in Burmese, um, which uh, in, its, in its existing condition. And on the right side, uh, when it was cleaned, and, uh, and when it was cleaned, it was a big surprise because we actually saw uh, that um, uh, the, all this naga had been uh, lacquered. Uh, so you had, you had two layers. You had a, a, um, uh, you had a red uh, lacquer layer. And on top of this red lacquer layer, you had a black lacquer layer. And so also on the left side, some of the interns of uh, ATUM and MTU doing the cleanup. So I mean, they are actually working on the, on the board uh, of the balustrades of the, uh, of the, uh, of the veranda. Um, yeah. And here, after, um, after the, the Naya were actually uh, decleaned, uh, they were uh, reinstalled um, at their uh, original location. A, th a third aspect of the physical inter intervention is actually being currently uh, undertaken is a masonry staircase stabilization and restoration. And uh, so, uh, uh, like um, Lisa was mentioning, it has involved uh, a lot of the WF staff working in Cambodia and Thailand. So um, our Myanmar colleagues have had the chance to interact with con Cambodian and Thai counterparts who are working in Wacha in, Ayu in Ayutthaya or uh, Plombakeng in, um, in Cambodia. And also, uh, the, we also have a second, um, WF has a second project, project in Molmien in, in southern Myanmar in, uh, as a, with the restoration of the Jusun Church. And all these colleagues have been able to uh, work together on this uh, uh, masonry staircase uh, uh, stabilization and, and uh, restoration. So, just to give you an idea, so this work has been done for one staircase, but there are, um, there are five of them around the stru uh, structure. So, and the last physical intervention, which actually is a, the focus of this presentation, is about the uh, uh, carving of missing uh, wood, woodwork. So, I'll be now uh, explain to put this, uh, I mean, aspect of the project into a la larger picture of the tradition of woodcrafts in, in Mandalay. So the tradition of woodcrafts um, in Mandalay emerged in a very fav favorable context. Uh, we had an extensive patro patronage by royalty and wealthy merchants uh, of secular and religious structure. We had a ver uh, an abundance of, of uh, timber resources with various species like uh, teak, uh, like paddock, uh, uh, and, and many other species. 
Uh, and, um, and so one, one uh, another aspect was that uh, Buddhist beliefs associate the donation of, of religious structures with merit making and support of uh, the monastic order. And lastly, um, because it was a royal center, we had a lot of craftsmen uh, uh, settling down around the royal city because I mean they were uh, we could work easily for uh, for the construction of uh, royal of royal structures. So the tradition of woodcrafts is centered on on three distinct distinctive uh, types of work. One uh, is uh, focusing on uh, on the figures in the round. Uh, called in Myanmar Yolong Pondu. Another is uh, centering on decorative um, uh, motifs like uh, leaves or, or flowers, and it's called uh, Pain Pondu. And more is, uh, the last one is more technical. It's called Letama Atta, and it's about really carpentry work uh, uh, in its most uh, in its basic, in its uh, technical uh, uh, meaning. So the first two types of work are shown here in, in the picture uh, taken uh, at the Shwedagon Pagoda in, in Yangon uh, in, the 1870, in the 1870s. And uh, in most cases, we don't see it because it's a black and white picture, but in most cases, all these works were actually gilded and uh, with some gold foil. Here, uh, I mean, there's, there's, there's so many pictures like this, black and white pictures, which give, uh, I mean, which details the really high level of, of craftsmanship that uh, these carvings attained. And I'm only showing two pictures. One uh, from the Atumashi Monastery, this central monastery, which was located, uh, which, is, which, which is still located in, in the middle of the cluster of, of eight monasteries I was referring to earlier on. And, but um, unfortunately, this monastery burned down in 1856. Uh, and um, again, here too, uh, another monastery which burned down, um, the Queen Supalayat Monastery. Um, um, yeah, so we, you see the, the level of, of, uh, uh, of details uh, of, of, uh, of the carvings. Later in time, we have uh, luckily some um, uh, surviving uh, examples of, of very high level, uh, um, uh, very refined uh, sculpture, I mean like uh, carvings. And one of them is the eastern entrance of the Mahamuni Pagoda in Mandalay. And uh, this uh, pavilion was actually commissioned by a lay person in, um, uh, in the early 1910. And uh, a famous uh, wooden carver, wood carver, Sayakin, and his covers uh, completed uh, this uh, Eastern Pavilion. So you see, it's it's all wood. I mean, you, uh, as may, I mean, as surprising as it may uh, appear, it's all wood. It's very intricate, and uh, I mean, somehow it has. Uh, I mean, we are in 2019, and uh, it has remained uh, so. Here is another view of of the same pavilion. We have uh, here. A very uh, again a, a very elaborate uh, carving which is called uh, Linotang in Myanmar, and uh, so again it's 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 almost like s screens um, uh, that uh, through which uh, the, the light is uh, is filtered, and here on on the left side on the right side you have uh, a, a, a close-up picture um, of of the bee nest like carving which is in Myanmar called uh, Piaswe. Another example also is the southern entrance of the Chenta uh, Pagoda in Mandalay. Uh, it shows a multi-tiered um, structure uh, decorated uh, by uh, Sayasain, who was the son of Sayakin, the same person who did the, the Eastern Pavilion in, in, uh, at the Mahamuni in, uh, in Mandalay. And uh, so his name was actually, he actually signed uh, the pavilion with his name here. And uh, we have a picture uh, of him um, I think it, we, there's no date, but we can assume it could have been like in the 1930s, uh, just before World War II. I'll move on to the last part of this uh, talk. Um, uh, I, I mean, I'd, be, I'd briefly talk about the methodology. Um, uh, so what do we do when we have uh, a building like this, which has uh, undergone 
so many restorations, so many, um, uh, so many changes, as we saw with the flooring pattern uh, of the veranda, and uh, um, a, a change that uh, the Department of, Arche of Archaeology had itself uh, decided to, to do. Um, so the main, the main approach was really to go back to the original pictures, I mean, to not the original pictures, but to, to use the pictures taken by the Archaeological Survey of India in 1904 and use them as a reference uh, document for, uh, for this methodology. So we had, um, we had these beautiful pictures which uh, were taken somehow uh, 18 years later uh, after the building had been relocated to, the, to, it, to its existing location. And we, I mean, we don't know, but that's, we, we have no idea about the, um, uh, the actual uh, condition, uh, the actual, um, how would I say, uh, how, how the building looked like when it was relocated to, his, to its current location in 1882. But so we've decided to use these pictures as a, as a reference document. So we have here, um, a, I mean, a, a listing of the different parts that were gone missing all over these years. And um, so it's, it's only for one side of the, of the building. And here, uh, um, using an, one of the pictures taken in 1904, a more, uh, uh, I mean, like, uh, actually a, a, better list, a better view of what's, what had gone missing, what was gone missing. Here, um, so we had to do based on, on this, um, I mean, photographic inventory, we came uh, with a different, uh, with a listing of the different uh, missing carvings. And uh, so we had to uh, talk with, uh, uh, with the carvers and, and uh, we had to ask them what, I mean, how do you call these parts? I mean, because sometimes it's, it refers to uh, a, a symbolic, uh, it has a symbolic meaning, sometimes it has a technical meaning, so we had to, uh, juggle with these types of, uh, um, uh, I mean, uh, problems. And so this is only for the southern part, the southern veranda, uh, with eight, uh, eight carvings, uh, eight types of carving being, uh, being mis uh, missing. But of course, for each carving, as, as we show here, oh, sorry. Um, so, for example, this lino tongue, this bat-like uh, carving, uh, so it's one type. But for each of these types, we have uh, many uh, different elements which are which are missing. So um, the purpose, I mean, like our idea was to have the carvers, uh, um, I mean, actually carving this type, this number uh, of uh, of lino tongue. So here is a picture of the of all the carvers who uh, have uh, done, uh, I mean, wonderful work for the past uh, year and one and a half year or so. So the interesting thing is that we were able to locate uh, Ukan Jong, the, the person in the, in the, at the center, who had been involved in the 1995 restoration campaign undertaken by the Department of Archaeology. And he, so he had done work at this monastery and he had spent time, he was not a, a proper staff from the department, but he was very attached to the building. And uh, so it was for him a very a great honor to, to come back and do further work uh, on, 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 the, on the building. And the funny thing is that, uh, well, I mean, it's not so funny, but he, he, was, uh, uh, he was kind of, uh, uh, was quite frank in telling us that he had been a bit disappointed by the result of the of the car being made in 1985 because he had been given so much pressure by the DOA to complete in time with a very low budget uh, to, to complete all these carvings that he was not very happy uh, of uh, I mean, what was done. So, I mean, this new campaign was uh, uh, for him an opportunity to, 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 I mean, to make up for what he was not happy about. So um, here is, I mean, after uh, what we had identified as missing woodwork, we had um, 
colleagues doing, um, I mean, like stencil drawings uh, based on uh, computer edit drawings of, of the missing uh, woodwork. So Kim Brani has been uh, very, has been very uh, good at, at drawing on, uh, on computer uh, all the types of uh, missing carving uh, that we needed to be uh, recarved. Here you see Uponjo uh, doing work on uh, uh, Daipon. And here is a stealth in painting, uh, which is using to, uh, uh, I mean, at the, very, at the preliminary stage of the carving to, to actually uh, shape the contours of the, of, the, uh, of the carving. And here the, you have the end, I mean, the resulting, the, the final um, Daipon. Uh, with more, uh, floral pattern. So here is a picture showing uh, what we had uh, for a section of the southern veranda um, uh, on, at the lower um, part of the balustrade with many of the missing carvings uh, just left blank. I mean, the, the DOA had just put bare planks to, uh, because they had no budget at that time. And, and uh, so it was easier for them to, to, to just put uh, blank, blank uh, I mean, bare, bare planks. And uh, so that's the work that has, that has been done by Oak Kanjong and his team uh, uh, for this southern veranda. And we have now, I think, um, a very interesting, um, uh, I mean, a very interesting uh, carving and, uh, um, uh, yeah. So here is the restor restored woodwork uh, of the southern veranda again, uh, with a, with a uh, uh, in, a, in a larger in a larger picture. Again, this used to be just a bare plank. This was not even a feature. I mean, there was nothing. So the the naya, which are which I'm not showing here, were actually uh, left. Um, I mean, under without protection uh, from the, from the rain. So I think it's, and you, you have to imagine that in a few months' time, I mean, within one year, um, the, this kind of uh, beige or, or uh, color of, of the carving will be, uh, I mean, will be gone because there's so much rain. Uh, so uh, it's very likely that uh, uh, the teak will actually take uh, the, the, um, the color of, of uh, um, the patina is going to come very fast. Here is another um, uh, is, is a picture of the corner of the uh, southwest the, the southwest corner of the, of the veranda and showing uh, again here is um, here is a, pa a pansway here is a cassie bank I mean all these parts have different names and it it's, it shows a very rich vocabulary that uh, Burmese carvers have been using for all these years. Uh, to, to actually designate parts of, uh, of, the round, uh, of the veranda. So it's very, uh, I mean, it's always uh, interesting to, to, I mean, communicate with them because uh, it's, it's very so, so rich. Um, here is, um, uh, is a upper board of the, of the uh, balustrade uh, with flying uh, magician. So it's like figures. Um, I mean, this is of course in, in progress, and so you have uh, pairs of magi magicians um, intertwined with uh, with floral pattern, and you have here Ukanjong and uh, Ponjong and his colleague working on the, on this uh, very same balustrade. Uh, here also another picture where um, where you see the chisels, and it's just amazing to think that uh, I mean Uponjo and Ukanjong work. With about like there are uh, I, I, I don't have the, the number uh, but it's close to sixty types of chisel uh, to actually uh, that they actually use for the, the work they achieve. So it's 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 very uh, impressive to think that they are able to um, I mean to complete to achieve uh, this type of carving with with such a, a array of of, uh, of technical tools. One of the main uh, problem we have, we have faced. Uh, with with the work they've done, because here is a sample. One one of the, one of the but we now we're going to move forward and, and ask them to do to redo this. 
but one of the main uh, problem we have faced with them is that they've been uh, very good at, um, uh, at at displaying their skill uh, as their skills and at recarve uh, carvings based on the needs that they were expected to uh, um, to do. So in, in a way, um, they we, what we were asking them is to revert to late 19th century style and, and, and tradition of carving, while what they've been they had been doing so far was more like um, and, uh, like uh, 2000 style uh, of of uh, of carving, and, and uh, so it, it's we 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 ha we we spend time telling them, look, you we we don't want you to to do like the commission the usual commission you 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 uh, you've been asked to do. We we want you to look at the original balustrade. We want you to look at the picture, and we want you to make sure that you understand. The, um, the movement of the figures and, and the curves and, and the, the, the deep relief of, of all these carvings. So and, uh, it took time, but and I think they, they, were, they, they, understand, they understood the challenge, but it's just that um, they, it, it was such an, unju uh, an unusual request. And, and uh, so I think it's, we, we've done this sample. I mean, they've done this sample, and uh, I think it's, uh, it's, it's it's a start for uh, um, a further work uh, being done on, on the veranda. So, uh, yeah, uh, thank you. <laughs> and I will show you now uh, a video that was just completed by the team, a team of uh, Myanmar uh, video producers. ไอ้ดาวน์เนี่ยเนี่ยเราดูว่าเสร็จดูว่าเนี่ยเนี่ยเนี่ยเนี่ยเนี่ยเนี่ยเนี่ยเนี่ยเนี่ยเนี่ย
who have been working a commercial market to understand a stylistic uh, effort that took place during the Kanban period and be sensitive to those proportional and shaping methods that were traditionally part of that period. So we've had to unwind some of those modern experiences that they've had to look at the things in the past in a way that perhaps woodcarvers in the past did as well. ကျွန်တော်တို့ကလည်းသူတို့ရဲ့အမွေအနှစ်ကိုပြန်ထိန်းသိမ်းတဲ့နေရာကျွန်တော်သူတို့ရဲ့အမူတိုင်းပဲက